Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Justin Peters. I hope that this finds you and your family doing well, and I want to thank you very much for joining me. I'm putting this video together because uh, in the last week or so, the buzz in the evangelical world has been that Benny Hinn has repented. I am recording this on the afternoon of Sunday, September the 8th, 2019. And uh, at the start of the week, on Monday, September the 3rd, Benny Hinn put out a video that really shocked the evangelical world in which he says that he has repented of his prosperity gospel theology and prosperity gospel preaching. Uh, this short video, is about four and a half minutes long or so, uh, went viral. And uh, it just went all over the place and uh, people were talking about it on Twitter and Facebook and all this. And so I saw it and I watched the video and I very quickly put out a statement on Twitter saying, do not be fooled. This is not repentance. And uh, I was beginning to get emails from people saying, oh, Mr. Peters, have you seen this? This is so exciting. It's such you know, wonderful news. And, and uh, some people, a lot of people on social media were expressing what I would uh, describe as uh, cautious optimism. You know, not totally buying it yet. They want to see how it plays out. But they were, many people were willing to give Benny Hinn the benefit of the doubt. Uh, and so when I put up my statement saying that this is not real repentance very quickly, uh, I got a fair amount of blowback for that. And uh, it, it really troubled me because some of the blowback was actually coming from people uh, in our theologically conservative circles, even soteriologically reformed circles. And that surprised me a little bit, I suppose. So uh, I, I watched this play out over the next several days, over the course of last week. Uh, I stuck, stuck to my guns and said, no, this is not repentance. And uh, so I want to put this video together to, to more fully flesh out than what I'm able to do on Twitter. Uh, why this isn't real repentance. And so if you will join me for the next, I don't really know how long this video is going to be, hour, hour and a half, thereabouts, uh, if you may have just seen my dog walk in. But uh, if you will join me for this video, uh, I think you'll see why this is not real repentance. And uh, this is going to, I think this is going to provide a good uh, lesson for us in what real repentance is actually is and what it looks like and we'll see that this is not it and I say that for a number of reasons now some of the most important things that I will say in this video will come towards the end of it so uh, I would I would ask that before you uh, comment in any kind of an extensive way on this video that you would at least um, uh, watch the whole thing so you can get the full context and, and see my real concerns that I will more fully flesh out towards the end of this. But we're going to look at a number of video clips of Benny Hinn, some from many, many years ago, some from just a few days ago. Uh, I'm going to play some clips from the interview that he did with Stephen Strang in Charisma Magazine, in which he more fully fleshed out uh, the comments that he made in that video. I think this interview, it's audio interview that he did with Stephen Strang, the editor of Charisma Magazine. I believe that that came out on uh, Thursday or Friday this past week. And so I'm going to play some clips of that and I'm going to show you that this is not repentance and this is not a change of heart uh, on the part of Benny Hinn. Uh, let me say that I wish that it were. I know many of you are probably thinking, in fact I even received an email to this effect, uh, well Justin's being too hard on Benny Hinn. Uh, some are thinking, oh well Justin actually hopes this isn't real from Benny Hinn because so much of my ministry, at least that for which I'm most well known, is my work engaging the Word of Faith movement, New Apostolic Reformation, Prosperity Gospel, and the Charismatic movement in general. And this is kind of what I'm known for. And I, I think some cynics out there probably think, oh, well, Justin just hopes this isn't real because then he won't be able to talk about Benny Hinn anymore. Dear friends, let me tell you that nothing could be further from the truth. I think I can honestly tell you with a crystal clear conscience before God that I would love nothing more than for Benny Hinn to genuinely repent. I would love nothing more than that for that to happen. Uh, I do not hate Benny Hinn. I do hate his ministry. 
uh, because of the incalculable, incalculable damage that it has done, both physical and spiritual damage that it has done to untold millions of people all around the world for the last 40 years. I do hate his ministry uh, because of the harm that it has caused, because of the reproach that it has brought on the gospel. Um, I hate it because we are supposed to hate anything that uh, opposes the true gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I do not hate Benny Hinn. I wish no ill on him. In fact, uh, I, I, I would love nothing more than for him to repent. I want Benny Hinn to be in heaven. I, I do not want him to go to hell. I want him to be in heaven. And Benny, if you are watching this by chance, I, I would ask that you please, please watch this video. Uh, I, I want you to come to true saving faith and repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ. But that has not happened yet. And uh, real, real repentance has not happened yet as, as we're about to see. Uh, so we're going to talk about this. We're going to talk about repentance. I'm going to show clips of, of uh, video clips and audio clips. And uh, let me also say while I'm thinking about it that as this video progresses, uh, let me give you fair warning. I am not a video editor. Uh, I'm kind of in over my head and doing even this video. So the audio level in some of these clips is going to vary widely. So uh, just be careful. Some of them you're going to have to bump the volume way up. Some of it you might need to tap it down a notch or two, but it shouldn't be too bad. So anyway, I, I ask your uh, forbearance with me as, as uh, and your patience as we go through on that particular aspect. So, uh, dear friends, uh, without any further uh, ado, I suppose we'll get into this. Um, the first reason that I do not believe that this is real from Benny Hinn, the first reason I'm skeptical, is all things considered a relatively minor one, but... Um, this is not the first time he has said this. Benny Hinn has repented of, quote unquote, repented of prosperity theology on a number of different occasions. Uh, the first one I'm about to show you, or you let you listen, or yeah, watch a video clip, very short clip, of what Benny Hinn said after the very first major expose was done uh, on his ministry. This was going back to the early 1990s, 92 or 93. This was done by Inside Edition. And uh, this this expose showed a lot of unsavory things within the Benny Hinn ministry. So uh, watch this. Watch what he had to say once this documentary was put on national television. Preachers who live in big homes and drive big cars are to re-examine their calling. So that short clip uh, was recorded back in the early 90s, I believe 92 or 93. Uh, Benny Hinn said this right after the first major expose was done on his ministry by Inside Edition. They went into his ministry. Benny Hinn, uh, in the, he really burst onto the scene, scenes in the late 80s, uh, 1990, very early 90s. He just, just shot up like a meteor and became very, very popular. So they did an expose. And in this expose, uh, they uncovered all kinds of financial misgivings, extravagant spending. And this was before Benny Hinn even became as popular as he would later become. I would say Benny Hinn reached his zenith in popularity, at least in the United States, around the year 2000, 1999 to 2000, 2001. So this was you know, almost a decade before he, he reached the, the pinnacle of his popularity. But uh, it was a, and I'm not using profanity here, it was a damning uh, expose. Uh, it, it truly was. All kinds of uh, extravagant spending, as I said, financial impropriety and uh, falsified miracles and, and uh, unsubstantiated claims of, of healing. And of course, this went nationwide and made a lot of news. And Benny Hinn's ministry immediately went into damage control mode. And uh, Benny Hinn had to address it. And he, as you just heard him say, it, he said this and I have the full video, but for time's sake, I'm not going to play it all. But anyway, Benny Hinn said uh, that uh, preachers who live in big homes and drive big cars ought to re-examine their calling. And he went on to say, he said, uh, he said, let me tell you, God has taken me by the neck. It really, direct quote, he's, he, this really got a hold of him. And then he said, uh, he said a little bit later, quote, I think I'm going to stop preaching healing and start preaching Jesus. 
Well, obviously that didn't happen because Benny Hinn is known for his preaching on healing. So, uh, but this expose really got him to begin to uh, reevaluate at least what he said, his teaching on prosperity. Preachers who live in big homes, drive big cars, need to need to reexamine their calling. Now, it was in the early 90s. This is a video that Benny Hinn recorded in February of 2018, so about a year and a half before today. So watch this from Benny Hinn. And, uh, you know, we got attacked for teaching prosperity. Well, it's in the Bible. But I think some have gone to the extreme with it, sadly. And it's not God's word, what is taught. And I think you know, I'm as guilty as, as others. Sometimes you go a little farther than you really uh, need to go, and then God brings you back to normality and reality. No, no, no. Because you read the, the more you know the Bible, the more you become, you know, biblically based and more balanced in your opinions and your thoughts. Because we, we are, we're influenced. When I was younger, I was influenced by the preachers who taught whatever they taught. But as I've lived longer, I'm thinking, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, this is this doesn't really fit totally mm -hmm. with the Bible, mm -hmm. and it doesn't fit with the reality. One, two, three. So you just saw. So you see in that recording from February of 2018 that uh, Benny Hinn said that he began to realize that that this really doesn't. Uh, square with the Bible. It's not totally biblical. And he said uh, that prosperity theology may have been taken a little too far. That's the understatement of the day. But uh, this was February of 2018. So why is it if he came to this understanding, let's say two years ago or thereabouts, that he is still putting blatant prosperity theology teaching on his program. Uh, for example, let's watch this. This was posted on August 23rd of 2019, just a couple of weeks ago as of this recording today. Welcome to This Is Your Day. Hello, I'm Steve Muncy, and this is the Benny Hinn Ministry Set. And today, with his permission, he has said, Steve, I want you to give this word to my partners and to my audience. I said to Pastor Benny Hinn, I said, you want me to give this word? You know how Pastor Hinn is. Yes, Steve, glory to God, hallelujah. I want you to give the word of God. So I said, okay, Pastor Hinn. So I'm here today telling you that the spirit of the Lord is upon me mightily. This is something that all of these false teachers do, as you just saw. Steve Muncy walks in, uh, makes it very clear that he's there by invitation from Benny Hinn. And he says, I want you to know that the Spirit of the Lord is on me mightily. And so this, this is their way of getting you to believe that what they're about to say, what they're about to command you to do, is directly from the Lord. Okay, so let's see what, quote unquote, the Lord told Steve Muncy to tell you to do. Job, listen to me closely. I've come on the Benny Hinn, this is your day, to give you almost, if I can say this, an emergency word. And only you, I'm only talking to you because you and I have connected by watching television, streaming, computer, smartphone, ever how I'm communicating with you. This is the moment in which God has put us together. And in my spirit, in your crisis that you're going through and what the devil has stolen from you, he has got you in a place that you cannot give. Let me tell you what's going to happen. In the next few moments, I'm going to ask you to go to the phone. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to say to you, by faith, as you pick up that phone, I'm going to give $77. I'm going to put it upon the altar. I want Pastor Benny Hinn to lay his hands upon it, but I'm going to give $77. Listen to me closely. Listen to me if you have ever listened to me. You say, I don't have it. I'm going to tell you before 
You send it. I mean, if you make the declaration, God will stand up and make sure everything that the enemy has stolen. Let me tell you, there's not enough money. You and I both know that. That can pay for health, pay for our children to come back into our lives, to restore our marriage or to give our job or or what we have lost. God, God will say to the enemy, what you have stolen, you must give back to them double. What you just heard is a very common theme from these false teachers. Uh, They will say, oh, we're not telling you that you can buy a miracle. There's no amount of money, as you just heard him say. There's no amount of money that you can give. No no amount of seed that you can sow to buy a miracle. We're not telling you that you can buy a miracle. We're just telling you that if you give us money, that God will give you a miracle. If If you give us money, God will restore your marriage. He'll give you your job back, give you a better job, and he will heal your body. So we're not telling you can buy a miracle. We're just saying, if you give us money, God will give you a miracle. Make sense? Okay. Let's go back to Steve. But I'm here to declare to you that you step to the phone and say, I'm giving $77. There's somebody watching me saying, I've got three children. You get three 77s. I'm talking to somebody that's got two businesses. You get two 77s. I'm talking about somebody that may say, I'm going to give 770 Dollars. I just feel compelled. I want to make the devil so mad and I'm going to put it upon the altar and the ministry so the gospel of Jesus Christ can be preached around the world by Benny Hinn. I want you to go to the phone, $77. I'm getting ready to pray. When you pick up that phone, something's going to happen. That's seven, which means complete and wholeness. So you go to the phone and say, God, I put this $77 upon the altar. I'm sensing somebody's going to give $707. You just said, I just, I, I sense I can do this. I'm a businessman. I could give $7,770. But let me to declare unto you now that the moment you pick up the phone, there is. But let me tell you, I'm going to go to the phone. I'm going to put it upon the altar. Let me just say this that when you go to the phone, it is all, it is an expression. When you pick up the phone and dial the number, it it is an expression in which you are saying, Lord, this is my offering upon the altar. I declare that God is going to stand up, look into the face of the enemy and say, give them back that business, give them back that job, give them back their children, give them back that health that you have stolen. Oh, I sense this. You must go to the phone. You must be the individual in which I have come to tell you that what Job did, he will do for you. My God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Oh, I sense somebody's going to get their health back and cancer's going to leave. I'm sensing somebody at this moment, your children have strayed, got on drugs, they're coming back. I sense you, I sense you, ma'am, you've lost a relationship with your husband or friend, but God is getting ready to restore it. I'm sensing something right now. Yeah, I'm sensing something too, Steve Muncy. I'm sensing that you're a false teacher. I'm sensing that you're a charlatan. I'm sensing that you're a wolf. You just heard Steve Muncy tell people that if they will sow a seed of $70 or $77 or $770, or maybe if they're a businessman, $7,700, if they will just send in money to Benny Hinn's ministry, that God will restore their marriage, he, if their children have strayed, he'll bring their children back. Uh, if they have lost their job, they'll get their job back. Or if they're sick, uh, they will be healed. You literally just heard him specifically mention cancer. If you give money, your cancer will go away. Well, you know, there's a lot of people out there watching who do have cancer. There are spouses out there, husbands and wife, and the, and the spouse sees his, his or her spouse with cancer or parents with who have children with cancer and they're desperate and they're sitting there and they're watching Benny Hinn. They're watching. This is your day. They're watching Steve Muncy and in desperation, they go to their wallet. They pull out their checkbook. They pull out their credit card and they send in money that many of these people can't afford. In fact, you, you even heard him 
a, a couple of moments ago saying that if, if you don't have the money to sow, if you don't have the money to send in, send it in anyway. Trust God. One day, these false teachers will have to give an account before a thrice holy God of what they are doing to sick and hurting and desperate people. Tell me, go to your phone because this is a historic moment. This is a day in which something incredible is about to happen in your life. Move to the phone now. Father, I'm just standing here. I got 20 seconds with this special person. And I know, God, that your word is true. And what you did for Job, you're going to do for them. $77. Go quickly now to the phone. And in the name of Jesus, I declare, I declare you are going to get back double what the enemy has stolen from you. Amen. And I declare, Steve Muncy, that you're going to receive something from the Lord too. But what you're going to receive from the Lord, you don't want. May God grant you repentance. And some will say, well, Justin, uh, these programs were recorded before Benny Hinn had his change of heart. And in fact, that's what Benny has said of some of these programs, that they were recorded uh, long ago before he came to this uh, new understanding of this uh, biblical teaching. Well, uh, I find that somewhat difficult to believe. Now, these programs very well may have been recorded uh, some months ago or maybe even a year ago. But uh, let's just say uh, that all of these programs, and by the way, his Twitter timeline is absolutely full of these programs. I mean, absolutely full of it to this very moment, full of this teaching. Uh, If he felt so strongly about this, and this grieved him so much, then may I ask why he still has this, these programs up? Why are they still on his Twitter timeline? Why is he still putting them up? Uh, he has a whole media team. Uh, he's got more money and he knows what to do with. Uh, it wouldn't be hard to pull these down. I mean, a couple of clicks of the mouse and, and they're gone, but uh, they're still up there. And so, um, yeah, it makes you wonder just how grieved about this he really is. Of course, the financial aspects of Benny Hinn's ministry uh, is just one small part of the problem. Uh, Benny Hinn has not changed in other aspects of his ministry at all. I've heard people say, well, he's not as, uh, he's not as flamboyant as he used to be. He's, well, he, he, he may not be waving his coat anymore, but uh, as you're about to see, uh, he is still very much into the slaying in the spirit and even... Holy Ghost laughter. So let's look and see how uh, Benny Hinn has not really changed very much at all. You? Lady, I'm glad you came. She, she's, somebody better help her up. She's a little drunk in the spirit. I'm happy you came. Wait, wait, wait. Bring her back a second. What church you go to? What church do you go to? What church? You go to any church? I came from Texas. Oh, oh, you came? Why are you feeling on you? I can't talk. Huh? You can't talk. She came from Texas. I didn't she from Texas. Dear God, that lady is having a... Oh. Lord, knock them all out. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You know, this has been happening here now for the last few weeks. I come out, lead worship, miracles happen. I pray the Lord will just keep doing it. Let me hear a bigger amen. And in two weeks, I'll be back here in two weeks. The Lord spoke to me very clearly to have every two weeks a healing service here. No, no, the man behind you. You came with the, with the pastor, right? The Lord's going to use you. That was fast. (laughs) She's getting it now. She's getting it too. 
What's going on here? You better lift your hands, pray in the spirit. Hold your laughter, just hit these people. What do you feel on you now? What do you feel on you? I, I don't feel anything. Why, 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 why are you stumbling like this? Why, why? Guess the pain is gone. Huh? The pain is gone. I know you said that earlier. Lord, here I'm all with holy laughter in Jesus' name. They all need it. Everybody needs it here tonight. Wow. They, look at her looking at me like that. Are you okay? She's talking in tongues. Wow. That's marvelous, isn't it? Come here, brother. Come here. Come here. I don't think he can get up. Come here. That anointing is that anointing is all over him. It's all over you, brother. What? Come on, lift your hands and receive it if you want it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you just saw that Benny Hinn has not really toned down his tactics. I would say the only thing that's really been toned down is the size of his following. Benny Hinn has nowhere near uh, the following that he did back at, uh, in, the, in his heyday in the late 90s, very early 2000s. Uh, Benny Hinn used to rent out 10, 20,000 seat auditoriums, coliseums. Now he's down to hotel ballrooms and even his own television studio. So he doesn't have nearly the following that he did uh, many years ago, which of course may be one of the reasons that he's changing his tactics some. That's the cynical part of me, I suppose, but I think there's good reason to think that. Um, but also, more to the point of what we just saw, being slain in the spirit and Holy Ghost laughter. He has been doing this for... Decades, literally decades. Uh, I've been to 17 of his Miracle Crusades, and I've seen all of this in, in person. He's known for blowing on people. He used to wave his coat at people. He doesn't really do that anymore, but he still blows on, one or blows on them or touches them, knocks them over, or yells fire or something like that, and they fall over, as you just saw. Uh, the question that needs to be asked in evaluating is this is, is it biblical? And it's not biblical at all. There's no evidence. There's no support for this to be found anywhere in Scripture. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that even remotely looks like this, uh, with the exception of John chapter 19, when uh, the Roman soldiers came to arrest Jesus, and he said, Whom do you seek? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am. And it says that they drew back and they fell to the ground. And that, that's the closest thing in the Bible that actually looks kind of like being slain in the spirit. Um, problem with that though is that the people who were being slain, who drew back and fell to the ground, were not Christians. These were the Roman soldiers coming to arrest Jesus. So you cannot take that as biblical support for something normative for Christians today at all. In fact, uh, there, nowhere in the Bible, Old or New Testament, do you see any person who belongs to the Lord falling over backwards. We do see a few examples of people who go before the Lord in worship, face forward, but they voluntarily lower themselves down, face forward. Uh, anytime in the Bible you see somebody falling backwards in the presence of God, it is always in judgment. So this is not an experience after which I would be seeking. As for Holy Ghost laughter, uh, Rodney Howard Brown, who not so humbly refers to himself as the Holy Ghost bartender, is the one who began to popularize uh, this phenomenon, laughing in the spirit, Holy Ghost laughter. And um, we saw it just there with Benny Hinn. This is not biblical either. Nowhere in the Bible do you find anyone in the acute presence of God laughing. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. Uh, when John found himself uh, in in the presence of Christ, he he went down, prostrated himself, 
when Isaiah got his vision of the Lord, he cried out, he said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah was absolutely undone by his own sinfulness in the presence of holy God. So we don't see anyone in the scriptures getting their chuckles off of the king of glory. So what Benny Hinn continues to do is profoundly unbiblical. Now, in addition to financial prosperity, the thing for which Benny Hinn is most well known is his teaching on healing, physical healing, that physical healing is provided for and guaranteed in the atonement. Uh, don't have time to go into this uh, fully. Physical healing, I do believe, is provided for in the atonement, but it is not guaranteed to be realized here and now. A glorified body is also provided for in the atonement, but I don't see anybody walking around today with their glorified bodies. So uh, not all the benefits of the atonement are promised to be fully realized this side of heaven. But Benny Hinn, in classic word of faith, New Apostolic Reformation, Prosperity Theology. Remember, prosperity is not just money. It's also healing. Benny Hinn has not shifted one iota in his teaching on physical healing, that it is always God's will for someone to be physically healed. If you are healed, then it is God's will. Excuse me. If you are sick, it is God's will for you to be healed. And you can be healed uh, as long as you have enough faith or as long as you say the right things, positive confession, as long as you sow a seed. Now, Benny Hinn says he's not teaching that anymore, uh, but he does still teach that it is always God's will to be healed, provided that you have enough faith. So I'm going to show you some video clips of some, uh, some more documentaries, exposés that were done on Benny Hinn's ministry from uh, quite a while ago, from the mid to late 90s, these and uh, I just want you to see just a few examples of how Benny Hinn's, what is really an over-realized eschatology, that, we, that all of the benefits of the atonement are promised to be here, realized here and now as long as you have enough faith. Uh, just a small sampling of some of the effects that this teaching has on real people. Watch this. No. Look, look, look. It's not my job to call their doctor. All things are possible, Lord. A lot of the healings sound incredible, and sometimes nobody in a place seems more stunned than Pastor Benny. But no matter how incredible the cure, he will use them on his TV show, This Is Your Day, without even checking back with the individual for verification. Anybody could make up anything. Someday somebody's gonna do that. And what are you gonna say then? I don't know, I can't tell you now. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. Oh, yes, it has. Remember that woman supposedly cured of polio? Pastor Benny knows it made for a great episode of his TV show. He knows it probably helped squeeze even bigger donations from his flock. But there's something he doesn't know. Pastor, Steve, all I know is... Pastor, let me, let me just say no, no, let me say something. Go ahead. That woman works for us. Woman doesn't have polio, never did. Then why did she say she had? We put her up there to see if he could tell her story was not true, to see if it would matter to see if he would ever check. And you sat right here and told me a few moments ago, we never put him on television unless we check. You never called that woman. You never called her doctor. You did no checking whatsoever. Well, she was one we missed. And speaking of missed, who missed the truth about this woman who claimed to be born profoundly deaf, unable to hear a word? And now you can hear me. Yes. There was plenty of time to thoroughly check her story before publishing his latest book, but apparently nobody bothered. In your book, the last chapter, it says Candace Brousseau was born profoundly deaf in both ears. Correct. But Candy's doctor, Howard House, he's treated her more than 35 years, and he knows Benny's claim in the book is simply not true. She was born with a very severe hearing loss. She was not born deaf. So in addition to not being truthful about... Uh, doing the follow-up, following up with the doctors. Benny Hinn has said this, claimed this many occasions, that uh, he never puts anyone up on his television program unless his ministry first follows up. At one point, an old interview I saw of him, he says, we have five 
steps to our follow-up. Well, well, no, they don't. In fact, I've spoken with someone, not Costi, but someone else who used to work for Benny Hinn's ministry. Uh, and I asked this young man, I said, Benny Hinn claims that there is a, a department in the ministry that follows up with these people who claim they've been healed to see if they really are healed. Uh, does that, do you know of this department? He said, not only do I not know about it, it doesn't exist. So Benny Hinn's just, he's lying and he's lied about this for decades, literally. Uh, so the integrity issue is one, but, but more to exactly what we just saw with that woman who says that she was born deaf. Uh, we just saw from her doctor, she was not born totally deaf. She was born with profound hearing loss, mostly deaf. In fact, you can even tell by how she responded to Benny Hinn by the, you know, the quality of her voice. You could tell that she's still deaf. Uh, this is what you see at Benny Hinn Crusades is is ladies like this, people like this, who suffer from an illness or a malady that cannot be readily seen. Partial hearing loss, uh, fibromyalgia, or um, people with cancer. Of course, sometimes that manifests and, and you can tell a person has it, but sometimes you can't. Um, you know, bursitis in your shoulder or something like that. These are the kinds of people the people with these types of illnesses who are who claim to be healed up on his platform it's all of the people that he says are healed are healed from something that cannot be readily seen and this is what we call a psychosomatic healing psychosomatic mind body mind over body that's a psychosomatic healing uh, and there's any number of conditions that you can get temporary relief from and and when you're in a closed environment with dim lights, uh, rhythmic music, emotionally charged music, uh, you 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 kind of get sucked into this like almost a, a first stage of hypnosis, if you will. Your 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 intellect is disengaged. You kind of turn yourself over to feelings, to emotions, uh, to the energy in the room. You know, with being in a large group of people all kind of uh, thinking the same thing, this group dynamic type thing. And when you're expecting a miracle, when you're expecting something to happen, when you, you've been told that you will be healed as long as you have enough faith, you will be healed as long as you have enough faith, people begin to think they feel better. And they do feel better for a little while. You know, someone comes up and, oh, well, I, I had pain in my right shoulder, but you know the the pain is gone. Well, can you move your arm? Can you move your shoulder? Yeah, yeah, I can. I can move my shoulder, and and people and Benny Hinn proclaims them to be healed. That's a psychosomatic healing. This is well documented in the medical literature. Well, well documented. Uh, it's a, it's the sugar pill effect. It's a placebo effect. You do feel better for a little while, until you leave the event. You go home. The euphoria subsides, a new day dawns, and the symptoms always reappear. Psychosomatic healings happen all the time. What you do not see at Benny Hinn Crusades are organic healings. An organic healing is a genuine healing that cannot be explained by a temporary rush of adrenaline or emotion. Uh, and so you see ladies like the, the one who says that she was born deaf, you see healings like that. What you do not see, you do not see people like Shandez healed. Watch this. In this impact investigation, we take you behind the scenes into the prayer rooms and the money rooms of Benny Hinn's $50 million a year miracle business. A rainy day in Georgia. Hours before Benny Hinn arrives for his two-day crusade, hey, come on down. Come on. Atlanta's 15,000-seat Omni Arena is filling up fast. Jesus. And miracles are already being proclaimed. I'm healed. I'm healed. All the pain is gone. I don't have one speck of pain anymore. Everyone's in need of a miracle. Many miracle seekers make long, difficult journeys to see Benny Hinn like Linda Tyson and her 17-year-old paralyzed son, Shandez. 
They drive six hours from their home in Elba, Alabama. I'm hoping for a miracle, a big blessing. But from the specialist familiar with Shandez's injury, the prognosis is bleak. It would be very unusual for someone having this severe an injury to have a miraculous recovery. Shandez was a star football player, recruited by several colleges, an honor student, until a routine tackle in his high school's homecoming game left him hopelessly paralyzed. People always say things happen for a reason. To this day, I don't know what reason. I try not to ask why. Arriving late in Atlanta, mother and son cannot get into the crusade. They find okay. shelter from the rain in a concession area beneath the arena. They will return the following night. Blessed be the Lord. It scares me, because I know I'm not the healer. I become aware of my responsibility to uh, make sure that these dear people realize first I'm not their answer, but Jesus is the answer. Linda Tyson and her son Shandez, who were turned away the first night of the crusade, also failed to get in the second night. But they were taken backstage where Benny Hinn briefly laid hands on Shandez and prayed for him. Shandez's condition has not changed, but his mother says that's all right for now. I feel I got to hold on to that hope, you know, no matter what anyone says, you know, as if he's not going to get better. I just had to hope and believe that he will. God does care about our pain and our, and, and our sorrow. Several weeks after the Atlanta crusade, Benny Hinn was reflective about his role as a spiritual healer. If Benny Hinn can give people only one thing, I'm satisfied, and that's hope. So dear friends, we see that the lady who was born with profound hearing loss, she was proclaimed healed by Benny Hinn on his platform, but Benny Hinn did not proclaim Shandez healed of his quadriplegia on his platform. In fact, Shandez was not allowed anywhere near the platform because people who are obviously crippled, who are, who are profoundly disabled or profoundly sick, uh, those kind of people are not allowed anywhere near the platform. And I know this because I've been to these things. I've been to these meetings. I know how they work. Costi will tell you the same thing. Uh, so it's very easy to proclaim someone healed of some hearing loss, but not someone like Shandez. Uh, th for Shandez to be healed, that would be a genuine miracle. That would be a real miracle. That would be what we would call what we call an organic healing. Because no, no matter how happy or optimistic Shandez may get, He's not coming out of his wheelchair. I was born with cerebral palsy. I walk on crutches. And no matter how happy I may be at a certain point during the day, no matter how optimistic I may be, uh, no matter how good of a mood I may be in, uh, if you take my crutches away from me, down goes Fraser. Okay. These are, these are the kind of pe people that look like me, people that look like Shandez, people who are in uh, who are obviously crippled and disabled or deformed they're not allowed anywhere near the platform because psychosomatic healings don't work with those type cases uh, it, it it breaks my heart honestly and I'm sure your heart was grieved as you watched that video of Shandez and as Benny Hinn was asked about that by the reporter he says if I can only give people one thing, it's worth it, and that's hope. That's not hope, Benny. What, what good is false hope? False hope is no hope at all. You're not doing anyone any good. You're not benefiting anybody. You're just playing on, you're praying. You're praying upon their, their, their fears. You're praying upon their desire to to no longer be sick, to no longer be crippled. And for decades, you have taken their money, promising them healing if they will just sow a seed into your ministry. Benny Hinn's promises of healing can not only be um, 
It can not only be injurious to one's emotions, uh, they can also be injurious to one's physical health, so much so it can actually put people's lives in danger. Watch this. Jesus is still in the healing business. There's one, two, three. Nobody gets the faithful out of their wheelchairs these days any faster than Benny Hinn. And when Pastor Benny comes to town, no civic center is big enough. Not in Philadelphia the other day, not in Houston the month before, not in Long Beach, California the month before that. At every stop from coast to coast, thousands who want a free seat can't even get in the doors. And what do they come for? Many come to be healed because they believe Pastor Benny when he shouts, People, everybody here can be healed tonight. All the pain out of the wheelchair. She's a victim of brain cancer. This is marvelous. Her family has driven her hundreds of miles for the cancer to be healed tonight. Every bit of it goes. Satan, you lost this one and you'll never get it. Three weeks later, while Benny was running and rerunning the miracle on TV, she was still sure x-rays would show no cancer. But we were there when she went for further tests. She has not been healed. Her kind of terminal cancer has never been known to just disappear. That lady Benny is calling down from the choir didn't call her doctor either before she went home and put away her heart medicine because Benny told her God had healed her. You, you don't plan to take it? Uh, no. No, I've got a healing from the Lord. No. So Benny Hinn proclaimed that lady with cancer healed when in fact she wasn't healed. And then the other lady who has, has a heart condition, uh, she, she said that she was going to stop taking her heart medication. Why? Because Benny Hinn proclaimed her too to be healed. Benny Hinn doesn't know that. He has no idea. He has no way of knowing if those two ladies have been healed. Actually, I, I, I should correct myself. He does know. He does know that they have not been healed. But you see, in addition to the spiritual dangers of this movement and what Benny Hinn has done, there are physical dangers. Because you see, in word faith theology, Benny Hinn has not renounced word faith theology, by the way. But according to word faith theology, New Apostolic Reformation, it is always God's will for you to be healed as long as you, what? have enough faith. What better way to betray in oneself a lack of faith than to do what? Than to take your medicine or to go see your doctor. Because if you take your medicine and you go see your doctor, then what you're saying is, is that I'm not 100% sure God has healed me. And that, according to Word Faith Theology, that is the fastest way to lose your healing. And so in a very misguided effort to not portray uh, any lack of faith, what a lot of people do is they stop taking their medicine and they stop going to see their doctor and they die. They die. Many, many, many cases have been documented. And I say this with all respect. Only God knows how many multiplied tens, if not hundreds of thousands of other people have lost their lives because they have listened to Benny Hinn or to others like him, Kenneth Copeland, um, even Joel Osteen, uh, I mean, Rod Parsley, Creflo Dollar, Bill Johnson, uh, Sean Boltz, I mean, you just on and on and on. How, how many how, millions I, I think it's safe to say millions of people in the last 40 50 years that this movement is movement has been so popular have lost their lives because uh, they don't want to portray in themselves or portray in themselves any lack of faith and so they stop taking their medicine they don't go to see their doctor because if you do that it says that you really don't have the kind of faith that you're you're supposed to have and therefore God won't heal you and people get worse and people die. But more importantly, what became of his promise to stop preaching healing? Well, take a look at this scene from his crusade just last month. People, there's so many miracles here, I can hardly keep up with them. The truth is, healings are still at the heart of the hen ministry, the hook that keeps them coming and keeps them giving. And you never say to anybody, this person is healed. No, You're never. Healed. No, no, no. I leave Ferguson. 
said you are healed by the power of God. The disease, dear lady, has just died and you will live. The Lord has healed you. Jesus is healing your mama. <laughs> will you ask the Lord to heal you, sweetheart? Go ahead. Jesus, will you heal me? And that's the danger with Benny Hinn's ministry. When he laid hands on Laura Twilly two years ago, she told everyone it was a miracle cure. I have cancer all over my body, and uh, I haven't been able to walk at all, or pretty much stand, and I'm doing pretty good now. She even threw away her cancer-fighting drugs, but within two months, she was dead. That was her last option because the doctors were not delivering the type of results that she wanted and when it came down to the end um, she she was crushed Laura had told her husband David and their children she wouldn't need doctors anymore she was putting her faith in Benny Hinn and his helpers they prayed for her and told her tonight was going to be her night to be healed and that she would be cured and she would would not need the chemo and the radiation and all of the narcotics that she had been taking for the pain. But according to her husband, she left that auditorium instructed by your staff not to go ahead with her chemotherapy, her radiation or even her pain relief because okay, she'd like, been healed. I would like to know who the staff member was who said that to her. I won't allow my staff to say such things. And if my staff said that to that gentleman, I will call my, uh, this man myself and apologize and file the staff member who said it. Because it's not right to tell people that. But it's not an isolated case woman buried here in Houston, Texas, Joyce Vaughan, was another one of the so-called miracle cures at a Benny Hinn crusade. Pastor, this lady had lung cancer. She was in this wheelchair. Another wheelchair. As you were ministering, she felt the heat come on her chest. Now she breathes freely, no pain whatsoever. She's been healed by God's power this morning. Her daughter, Jackie, says Joyce, too, was persuaded to turn her back on her doctors. One of the staff had told her she did not need her medicine anymore because Benny Hinn says she was healed. What did her doctor say when she decided then that she was not going to have the chemotherapy? He was very upset because she needed the chemo. She needed it. And if God was going to heal her, he, she would be healed either way. And she fought with that. She tried to call them for them to, for questions, the, the uh, staff at Benny Hinn. Do you know the case of Joyce Vaughan, the Houston woman? I, I'm, I'm sorry, no, tell me about her. Joyce Vaughan did come on your platform and was presented as having a miracle cure of cancer. Mm -hmm. She died. Before she died, to the distress of her doctor, she said she'd been instructed by your staff not to go ahead with her chemotherapy. That is absolutely untrue. She called to ask them questions because she was so uncertain about everything. No one returned the calls. She never could get a hold of anybody. And so by the time that she decided to go back and take the radiation, it had grown. Did her doctor believe that if Joyce had gone on with the chemotherapy, the cancer may have been beaten? Oh yeah, or stayed in remission, at least. Doesn't that, doesn't that worry you that in fact her life may have been shortened, having fallen under the spell of this? It bothers me if a staff of mine told her to quit medication or chemo chemotherapy. I have never said that to anyone. I can tell you here under the anointing, it will never come back. You will never, ever, ever. When Benny Hinn's show moves on, he doesn't get to see the sadness of the families left in his wake. Laura Twilley's daughters write to their mother every week still trying to understand how she could die after her miracle. On one side, Laura was telling them that I'm healed. You know, mommy's better. I'm not going to need the chemo and the radiation. But yet, on the other hand, 
when she died, that was the hardest thing for me to do, is to walk in that night and tell the girls that their mother was gone. You know what we're going to do? Send what are we going to... Send these to Mom. Wait a minute, not yet. But why are we going to send them up to Mommy? Because we love her. Okay, let go, girls. There they go. Let go, sir. What is the hardest thing, and I don't think he understands this, is when he puts up this, this hope, this expectation, and yet it doesn't come through. When the cameras are turned off and the lights are out, and he's out of the building, you're left there all alone by yourself. And you have to pick up the pieces and move on. Is that not heartbreaking? Dear friends, this is but a very, very, very small sampling. Stories like what you just saw can be multiplied by the thousands. Remember, Benny Hinn has been doing this for 40 years all over the world. There, there's no way for us to know how many millions of lives have been have been just destroyed by the teaching that comes from Benny Hinn and others like him. And the I want to I want to make this point. Benny Hinn may have changed his uh, teaching somewhat on financial prosperity. Maybe time will tell. Maybe, but he still teaches the same thing about healing. Uh, he hasn't changed that at all. In fact, when you just saw these old clips, old clips back back in the 90s or right around 2000 of, of Benny Hinn telling people that the doctors are wrong, you know, that uh, it, it, their, their sickness will never come back. Uh, you think he's changed from that? Oh, no. No, he has not. Watch this. On my two. Every bit of it goes. Help her up. For oh, you're pregnant. C-section, but I cancel it because I know Lord is going to give me a normal delivery. Are you, are you a Christian? Yes. Are you born again? Yes, I also pray in tongues that... The day Jesus anointed me, Satan just started attacking me. Well, honey, Satan is a loser. Don't worry about him. He was telling me that I'm going to lose my vision and I would... No, no, no. He's a liar. He's a liar. Uh, stretch your hands and pray for her in the spirit. You're real gentle there. Holy, holy. Darling, darling, look at me. Look at me. No, you're not looking at me. Look at my eyes. I'm telling you, as a man of God, the devil lied to you. The devil lied to you. You're not going to have a problem with your child. Uh -uh, look at me, don't. No, 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 no. Forget what the devil told you. Forget what the doctor told you. Forget if the whole world told you. I'm telling you under the anointing. So you just saw Benny Hinn tell that young pregnant mother that the doctors were wrong. I don't know if you caught it, but he slew her in the spirit before he realized she was pregnant. It's probably not a real good idea to be slaying pregnant mothers, pregnant ladies in the spirit, knocking them over. It's probably not a real good thing to do. But at any rate, he assured her that her doctors were wrong. This woman had a has a problem with her eyes, and she has some other problem with her baby. And I know this because I've seen the full clip, and I uh, don't know exactly what it was. She didn't really specify. But at any rate, he told her that the world is wrong and the doctors are wrong. And he says, he says, I say this under the anointing. In other words, I am speaking with the authority of God. And so this this young mother, this young pregnant lady, uh, clearly emotional, in all likelihood, and I don't have any way of knowing this in all fairness, but uh, as an educated guest, because I've studied this for so long and I've talked to so many people, uh, in all likelihood, um, 
she very well may not have gone back to her doctor or uh, ignored what her doctor has, has tried to tell her. Uh, and who knows? You know, it, I have no way of knowing what happened to her. And I'll tell you who else doesn't know what happened to her. Benny Hinn doesn't know what happened to her. So just like 20 plus years ago, Benny Hinn would tell people the doctors are wrong. The sickness is never going to come back. Well, he's doing the same thing today, dear friends. That was recorded, or at least Benny Hinn aired it, on July 23rd, 2018, just a year ago. So what he was doing 20 years ago, he's doing today. Benny Hinn has not repented. And so now, uh, for the conclusion of the video, rest of our time, I want to drill down more deeply into exactly why Benny Hinn has not repented. We're going to talk about what real repentance is, and we're going to hear some more clips uh, from the interview that Benny did with Stephen, S Steve Strang, editor of Charisma Magazine. I'm going to hear some clips from that, offer some comments, see a video clip, uh, and, and then we're going to talk about why Benny Hinn definitively has not repented. Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to my podcast. I am so pleased to have Benny Hinn. I don't think he's ever been on my podcast before. I was on his television program a couple of times over the years, and I've known Benny going back, you won't believe this, back to the 1970s before he was married. So we go way, way back, and thank you, Benny, for being on my podcast, especially this week when there's so much going around social media about what you had to say about Prosperity Gospel. Well, thank you, Steve, and I'm very happy to be your friend. Well, you're very nice. You're I want to offer just a very brief comment, even from that short introduction. Steve Strang, you just heard say, uh, has been friends with Benny Hinn since before he was married back in the 1970s. So Steve Strang and Benny Hinn have been good friends for 40 years. And Steve Strang knows exactly what Benny Hinn has taught for the last four decades and what he has done for the last four decades. And he's the editor of Charisma Magazine. And this, this goes to a broader point that, dear friends, there is zero discernment in the charismatic movement. I mean, there, there is just none. Uh, I, I watch Charisma Magazine on Twitter. I watch their tweets, and I, uh, I've read their magazine, have a subscription to it, or at least I did until recently. Honestly, the, the nuttiest, craziest, most looney tune stuff you could ever imagine is put out by Charisma Magazine. I mean, the craziest, nuttiest stuff. Follow them on Twitter. Uh, it's just, it's it's Looney Tunes. Make Babylon B look like a documentary. So anyway, uh, that's just to a broader point that there is no discernment, zero, in the charismatic movement. But back to the interview. And I don't want to get into that. Today, I'm 67 years old. I'm thinking about how am I going to finish? And what will I leave behind for the next generation? How will they view me? I want them to view me as one who preaches the cross. I do not want to be known for prosperity. I want to be known for someone who preached the cross of Jesus, salvation, one who teaches on the Holy Spirit, one who teaches on the anointing and the power of God, one who focuses on that, not on money, not on prosperity. That's not my call. It's never been my call. Yeah, I'll say people have used me to raise money for their ministries. You know. Well, you just heard Benny Hinn say that he's 67 years old and he's now more aware of his legacy, basically, and he wants to, uh, he wants to be remembered not for teaching on prosperity, but rather teaching about the cross, teaching about salvation, uh, that sounds good in and of itself. But then did you catch what he said right at the end of that clip? He says, people have used me. That is a very, very telling statement, dear friends. When he said that, honestly, Kathy and I were listening to it. And when he, when he made that statement, she and I just looked at each other and just like, are you kidding me? People have used you, Benny? As if you were just kind of this passive participant and, and you were being used by people? Benny, how about all of the people you have used over the last 
40 years. For 40 years, Benny. You have been promising poor people that if they will give money to your ministry, that God will get them out of debt. Uh, just a few years ago, I heard you tell people on uh, TBN that if they sow a seed into TBN, that that oil will be discovered under their house on their property. I, you, you said that. You know you did. It was just a few years ago. You have gone all around the world. And even though you're not nearly as popular here in the United States today as what you were uh, 15, 20, 20 years ago, Benny, you're still very, very popular overseas, as you well know. And I've been to many of the places that you've been to. And when you go overseas, you draw crowds in the tens, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people. You have, been to, you have done some crusades in some of the poorest countries on the planet. And what they lack in their ability to give per capita, you see, Benny, you make up for in sheer numbers. And you have told untold millions of people, poor people, in, in African countries, in Uganda, in South Africa, in India. You've told them that if they will give you money, that God will bless them, that God will prosper them financially, that God will heal their sick bodies or heal their sick children. You have been telling this to people for decades under the anointing of God. You've been telling them this. And you have used this money that you have that you have gained off of exploiting poor people, sick people, desperate people, widows, to amass a massive personal fortune, flying around in private jets, even though you say you don't do that anymore, may be the case, but you certainly used to, and live in huge palatial mansions and drive fancy cars and wear suits with your logo stitched on it in, in 24 karat gold thread. It's not an exaggeration, as you know. And you, you have the audacity to talk about how you were used? Benny, your lack of, of self-awareness is just gobsmacking. And this is a, this is a very telling statement. And this is, this is one of the reasons that I can definitively say you have not repented. Because that's not what repentance looks like. Repentance is not passing the buck off on someone else. Repentance begins with taking ownership of what you have done, owning it and confessing it, not blaming someone else. That's not repentance. About that next. Well, let me first start by saying that the change in my own heart and life to do with that has really nothing to do with anything that my critics have said about me. It has to do with my own heart before the Lord. The last two years, Steve, I've become very close to the Lord for one reason, because I want to please Him more than ever in my life, to be honest with you. I want to end well. When I go to glory, I want Him to smile. And I have told Him so many times, I told dear Jesus, I have grieved you enough. I've disappointed you enough in my past life. I do not want that for me today or tomorrow. So the prosperity issue is not really the main thing on my list. It's on the list, but it's not the main one. I just simply want to obey the Lord in everything he says, not just that. Benny, you are right in a sense that the prosperity issue uh, is not the main issue. It, the, the problem with prosperity theology is just one small cog in a very big wheel that is problematic in your theology. Benny, you do realize, you know this, that you have offered dozens, dozens of false prophecies. And you know what the Bible has to say about that. If you, if you utter a prophecy claiming divine authority, as you have done on dozens of occasions, and that thing does not come to pass, according to the book of Deuteronomy, you are a false prophet. And just as one example, in the 1990s, no, no, excuse me, December the 31st, 1989, you went into a supposed trance and you rattled off a whole litany of events that were supposed to happen in the then upcoming decade of the 1990s. You prophesied 
that in the 1990s, the east coast of America would be ravaged by an earthquake. You prophesied that Fidel Castro would die in office. Uh, you prophesied that we would have a woman president, a woman in the White House. You prophesied that by quoting you, as you know, 1994 or 95, no later than that, God will destroy the homosexual community in America with fire. None of those things happened, Benny. And according to God's word, you are a false prophet. And that's just, those are just some of the false prophecies you uttered on one night. You have dozens of others. As you well know, you are a false prophet. And according to Deuteronomy chapter, chapter 13, Deuteronomy 13, a false prophet, there's a penalty for that, and that is to be put to death. Now, I'm not advocating that, obviously. Not at all. Not at all. We are in the new covenant. But if we were still living in the Old Testament days, before the cross, you would have been stoned to death a long time ago, Benny. You've uttered many, many false prophecies. Not only have you uttered false prophecies, you have taught some jaw-dropping heresies, all of which you claim divine authority for what you taught. So it's not... It's bad enough that you taught heresy, such as the nine-member Godhead. And by the way, you claim that that was just a joke. Well, it wasn't a joke, and you know it wasn't a joke because I have the audio of it. You said that everybody was laughing when someone asked you about that. I think it was Pat Robertson, wasn't it? He asked you about that. Oh, yeah, that's just a you know, off-the-cuff comment. Everybody laughed. Well, everybody wasn't laughing because I have the audio of that, Benny. A nine-member Godhead, you claim that you got this revelation from God himself. Uh, you've uttered many, many blatant doctrinal heresies, and you that's bad enough, but then to add insult to injury, you claim God as the source of these heresies. Benny, according to every biblical criterion of the term, you are a false prophet. You meet every biblical criterion. If you're not a false prophet, then the term truly has no meaning. So you're right. Prosperity theology is just a small part of the problems that you have right now. And uh, that's yet another example, another reason why you have not repented. Uh, but here's another one. I'm going to play a video clip, a short clip from the September 3rd video that went viral. And um, I want everyone to watch this, Benny. I want you to watch it. And please, please listen. Hear me out. And I'm sorry to say that prosperity has gone a little crazy. And I'm correcting my own uh, uh, theology, and you need to all know it. Because when I read the Bible now, I don't see the Bible in the same eyes I saw the Bible 20 years ago. And Steve Strang from Charisma, whom we go back years, he actually, he was in my wedding. People don't even know that Charisma Magazine began with my father-in-law. Charisma Magazine started with Roy Harden, and I married his daughter. So Steve Strang was in, in my wedding. We go way back. And he's already asked me, said, are you ready to make it public? I said, well, not Totally. Because I don't want to hurt my friends or my love who believe things I don't believe anymore. Benny Hinn's comment that he has been used by others was a very telling comment. This comment is equally telling. Benny Hinn says that he has come to this new understanding of the unbiblical nature of the uh, prosperity theology that he has been teaching about two years ago. And Stephen Strang asked, him, asked Benny, are you ready to come forward? And notice what Benny said. He said, he said, no, not yet, because he he did not want to hurt his friends, uh, people who he loved that still believed this. And so he didn't want to come out with his with his new theology, his new understanding of the Word of God, for fear that it might hurt his friends. It might hurt people that he loves that still believe this. That is very, very telling, dear friends. Very telling. Benny Hinn has kept this hidden for two years. For two years he has kept this hidden because he didn't want to offend his friends. What about offending God? Benny, 
That is who you should be worried about offending, not your friends, God. This is very, very telling. Benny, you say that you love God. You say that you love Jesus, but you don't. You may think at some level that you do, but Benny, you don't because apparently you love your friends more than you love Christ because the moment you came to this understanding, if, if you really loved Christ as much as you say that you do, and maybe as much as you may think that you do, if you truly loved him that much, you would have been out immediately with this, and you would not have worried about offending your friends. You should be worried about offending God. He is the one that you have been offending. It is his name that you have brought reproach on. And so this is a very telling statement, dear friends. Friends, our love for God is not measured by feelings or emotions or warm, warm fuzzies. That's not how we measure our love for Christ. The only objective measure that we have for our love for Christ is not feelings and emotions, though they can be affected and certainly should be affected. But the only objective measure that we have for our love for Christ is our obedience to Christ. And if we do not obey him, we do not love him, period. Think about what Jesus said in John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him. Dear, dear friends, our love for Christ is not measured by feelings and emotions. It's measured by obedience. And Benny, if you're watching, you may think at some level that you love Jesus. But that's a very telling statement that you made just a week ago. And you've repeated since then. Very telling statement. This is further proof and very telling proof that you have not repented. Benny Hinn has not repented. Leaders. Many I've met with, some in my own home, some privately in, in other locations. And the subject came up. You know, we thank you for what you wrote in Good Morning Holy Spirit. We've been blessed by your ministry, such and such. But they all had a question to me. What is it you believe about prosperity? And when I told them, one-on-one, -on -one, they were shocked. I want to offer a comment here because he mentioned his book, Good Morning, Holy Spirit. Good Morning, Holy Spirit was his first really uh, runaway, best-selling book, sold millions of copies, and I read it back in the day and back in the 90s, uh, around 2000 when I was doing my, a part of, as part of my research for my master's thesis, that I wrote on Benny Hinn and the Word of Faith movement. But I bring this up because, Benny, as you know, uh, for your entire ministry, you have claimed an unusually close relationship and fellowship with God, with the Holy Spirit in particular. I want to read a passage out of your book, Benny, if you're watching. Good morning, Holy Spirit. So you're recounting here some of the uh, things that you claim that you experienced when you were much younger growing up. And uh, I have this, uh, I have a physical copy, but it's in storage right now. But uh, So I'm reading this off of the, off of the uh, what's it called, uh, Google Books or whatever it is. So I don't know exactly what page this is on in the original. I don't have my, I've got this quoted in my master's thesis. That's how I knew, it to, how I knew to uh, look this up. But you write, let's see if I can find it. Well, I don't see the page numbers listed, but at any rate, you write, Who is the Holy Spirit? He is the power of the Lord. Yeah, that's not really correct, but at any rate. That power became most evident to me when I began praying in my room, all alone. Day after day, hour after hour, I lifted my hands and said, Precious Holy Spirit, would you come now and just talk to me? Where else could I turn? My family was against me. My friends were few. Only him, only the Holy Spirit. There were times when he came in like a wind, like a fresh breeze on a summer day. The joy of the Lord would fill me until I could contain no more. As we talked, I would say, Holy Spirit, I love you and I long for your fellowship. And I found out it was mutual. He longed for my fellowship too. Once in England... I was staying in the home of a Christian family. My room was at the very top of the house. One evening I was lost in the spirit, having the greatest time in the world talking to him. The woman of the house called up, Benny, supper is ready. 
but I was bubbling over and didn't want to leave. She called again, supper is ready. And as, a, as I was about to leave, I felt someone take my hand and say, five more minutes, just five more minutes. The Holy Spirit longed for my fellowship. That is, um, that whole account, in another place in your book, you say that the Holy Spirit was your personal tutor as uh, you and the Holy Spirit literally sat on your bed and he, he tutored you, he taught you himself, the scriptures. But you have always bragged about this unusually close relationship with God, with the Holy Spirit specifically. So close, so intimate, even in your younger days. Back, this was back before you even started preaching, Benny, before you got married. In your very young days, you had such a close relationship with the person of the Holy Spirit that one day you were in your room, the lady of the house called to you, said, supper is ready. You started to stand up and walk out and you felt someone grab your hand. So you felt a, a, a physical hand grab yours, the Holy Spirit, and said, five more minutes, just five more minutes. The Holy Spirit longed for my fellowship. Benny, do you have any idea how blasphemous a statement that is? And here's the other question. If it is true, as you claim, that you have had such an intimately close, personal relationship with the Holy Spirit, with God, and if it is true, as you claim, that God speaks to you all the time, God gives you words of knowledge in real time about someone up there on the, in, the, in the studio audience who has cancer or someone who has a problem with their ankle or a, a, a lump on their ear or whatever. You get words of knowledge all the time and God speaks to you all the time. You, I don't even have to prove to you that this is true. I don't have to prove to anybody this is true because literally there are thousands and thousands and thousands of examples of this for the last four decades of your ministry, you have such a close relationship with God. He talks to you all the time. Benny, how is it? How is it that you have had this intimately close relationship with God who talks to you all the time? And yet, for 40 years, you have somehow missed that prosperity theology and the prosperity gospel in seed sowing is unbiblical. How does that work, Benny? That, that, that's, you, you cannot explain that. That stretches credulity. So you have such a close relationship with God that he tells you about people in the audience and certain ailments that they have or what God's going to do in their life and this and that. God talks to you all the time. And yet, the very thing for which you are most well known, the thing that your ministry has been marked by, the thing that you have been called out as being in serious, egregious error by hundreds of people for decades. And you have this close relationship with the Holy Spirit and somehow He did not bother to give you a heads up that one of the staples of your teaching has been wrong for 40 years? Benny, that right there. You do not have the relationship with God that you may fancy yourself as having, Benny. And Benny, something's got to give here. Something has to give. You have either been lying about all these times that God has spoken to you. You've been lying about how intimate your relationship with God has been. If you if you have had this close relationship with God, this was not this would not have been a, a new revelation for you. You've either been lying about it or you are up to your eyeballs in deep, deep deception. Deep deception. So in my meetings, when I would watch people, and I usually had other people raise the funds in the morning, and this has happened in the past. I'm not talking about recent. Recent, I'd, I haven't even allowed it. But in the past, when they would ask people to give a 1000 or whatever amounts, Steve... 80% of the people who came down, they did not even give it. They just came down. I don't know why they came down, but they came down. And what they were saying to them was not biblical. 
I did not have at that time the boldness and the courage to say, look, stop that. Today, I'm sorry, I cannot allow that, nor will I ever allow that. Nor will I myself do it, period, even though I did in the past. Because it's manipulation. It's gimmickry. To tell someone, you give a thousand, you're going to get a hundredfold. Benny, you are right. This is a gimmick. And uh, in and of itself, I am glad that you are no longer teaching this. I'm glad that you're no longer teaching that if you give $1,000, you can break the back of poverty or give $120 or give $77 or $770 or any of these amounts. Uh, in and of itself, I'm glad that you say that you're no longer going to teach that. Uh, time will tell, but in and of itself, I'm glad that you are no longer teaching that. First and foremost, I'm glad because hopefully fewer people will be deceived by this deception and they won't give away money to false teachers, money that most of these people don't have to give. So in and of itself, I'm glad that um, you say you're not going to teach this anymore. But unfortunately, in saying this, you have created a new problem for yourself. Uh, you have painted yourself into quite the tight corner. Because not only have you taught this erroneously for four decades, but Benny, as you know, for four decades, more often than not, when you teach this, you claim divine unction for teaching it. How many times, Benny, have you been on a TBN praise -a -thon saying something like this? Ooh, I've, I've never felt the anointing as strongly as I do right now. There, there's an anointing here for giving. There's an anointing here if you give. There's an anointing here for healing if you give money right now. The Lord is speaking to me. The Lord is telling me that if you will give money in the next, in the next 10 days, things are going to turn around for you. Uh, the, the cancer is going to go away. The, the, the dreadful diagnosis is, is going to change. Uh, you're going to get your job back. You're going to get this. You're going to get that. Your relationships will be restored. Your children will come back to your... God will God will bring your children back to your, your children that have strayed. God will bring them back if you give your money. The Lord is telling me this right now. Benny, you know you've done it. All of us know you've done it. So it's not bad enough just, just the fact that you taught it. But... As I said earlier, to add insult to injury, to compound the error, exponentially compound the error, you have claimed divine authority for teaching this. So if you are saying now that this has been wrong, that you've been wrong for teaching this for so many years, then how is it that you have claimed the whole time that God told you to teach it? God did not tell you to teach something that is wrong, obviously. So again, you have either been lying, flat out lying, making this up, claiming that God told you to teach these things, knowing full well that he did not tell you to teach them, or you are up to your eyeballs in demonic deception. And as I travel around the United States, travel around the world teaching on this issue, and Benny teaching against you and your theology, and not just you, but, but all others like you, Kenneth Copeland and Bill Johnson and Rick Joyner and Todd White and Joel Osteen and all these others. Um, one of the most common questions that I'm asked is this. Do these people know they're fake? Does Benny Hinn know he's a fake? Here's how I answer. There are some in this movement, people that I call the bottom feeders of this word faith theology, prosperity theology. Uh, people like Robert Tilton, believe it or not, I think he's still out doing his thing. Robert Tilton, Don Stewart, Peter Popoff, um, Mike Murdoch, who, at least up until recently, was one of your friends. Uh, these people I call the bottom feeders. They know full well they're charlatans, full well. They know everything that comes out of their mouth is a lie. They know that. But then there's others, and I would include you in this group, Benny, that fit into what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13, Paul makes a very interesting statement. He talks about how men will go from or grow from bad to worse, impostors. And he says this, he says, deceiving and being deceived. Deceiving and being deceived. Benny, 
you are a deceiver. You know that you have told many, many lies about major events in your own life and ministry. For example, you know that your father was not the mayor of Jaffa, Israel, as you claim. You know that you and an Episcopal priest did not really go into a hospital in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, Canada and heal everybody in the hospital. You know that didn't happen. You know that didn't happen. So you, And you know the people that you claim are healed on your platform are not really healed. Which leads me to my next question. In all your years of working at these crusades, have you ever seen a genuine, bona fide miracle of healing that and what happens, all these people that get up on stage and mm -hmm. they claim to be healed and Benny parades them and it's not just your uncle but others do it too, but but they, the faith healer parades these people on the platform yep. as having been healed. He couldn't hear before, now he can hear. Uh, he couldn't see before, but how many fingers am I holding up? Couldn't oh, walk, holding, but now they're... Couldn't walk. Yeah, these wheelchairs magically appear on the, on sure. the stage. Uh, take us there, brother. What's going on? I would add growing up to the years that I was involved. So growing up, plus working with my uncle and being involved in my own dad's healing ministry and all sorts of other chaos that occurred through extended family and other uncles and all that. Right. Um, no, not one. I have not seen one verified, miraculous healing live in person ever in my entire life. And you've been to how many of these? I could... I. I don't know, it'd be an exaggeration to pick a number, but it'd be an underestimation to pick a number. I just ton lots of them. I, yeah. Every year, all the time. It's just, it's a lifestyle. And yeah. then count all the Sunday night healing services that we had at our church growing up. The first Sunday night of every month was the healing service. Um, I've seen all sorts of things happen. I've seen people stand up out of their wheelchair, mm -hmm. but then leave in their wheelchair. Right. I've seen people paraded across the platform and someone say, Pastor, Benny, they couldn't walk but till tonight, and they felt heat on their legs, and now they're healed, and here they are, and the person limps across the platform. I've seen people say, I believe my tumor fell off, and they don't even, they're not able to verify it. Um, I've also gotten emails since, you know, ever answering questions publicly from doctors that have worked with my uncle. They'll send me messages on Facebook and say, hmm. I have to talk to you. I need to tell you about the healings that I verified. And... All they can tell me really? is a story of somebody who they believe really got healed. At the end of the day, let's just say that I saw nothing and somebody saw someone healed. It would fit the non-normative occurrence in which somebody experiences a wonderful healing. The same way that someone might actually respond to the gospel message that you yourself have told me before. Yeah. When my uncle preaches the gospel sometimes, he preaches a better gospel than some gospel preachers. Yes. So let's say somebody responds to that. Well, if they're a sheep, they won't last. Now their story might be, well, I was at a Benny Hinn crusade. He preached the gospel. Mm -hmm. I responded. And a week later, a friend introduced me to another friend, and I ended up in a Bible church, and here I am. And I mean, Benny Hinn's out there. I don't really agree with his theology, but that's how my journey started. And mm -hmm. you know what? God uses it. He really does. Yeah. But that all fits in the non-normative category of God working. What we're talking about is healings that they say are occurring all the time, people getting saved, millions of souls, I've been told, and we'll talk a little bit about that shortly. Uh, never, not one. You know that. You know that. So you are actively deceiving people. You have actively deceived people for 40 years. But, Benny, you are also being deceived. I really think, and I've, I've had this conversation with your nephew, Costi, I really believe, and, and he agrees with me, uh, that there is a part of you that at some level thinks you're doing the right thing, that thinks you're doing the Lord's work. Uh, you are deceiving and you are being deceived. But Benny, you are not a Christian. You are not a Christian. You have not come to genuine repentance. You have not come to true faith in Christ. I want to play one final, very brief audio clip from your interview with uh, Steve Strang, Charisma Magazine, and then I'll have some concluding thoughts and a concluding um, admonition and exhortation to you and to 
all watching. So number one, I don't want anyone to think or believe that I am changing because of my critics. It has nothing to do with anyone, period, including my nephew, including anyone else out there who may think that they brought the change in me. No, 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 that's, that's, that's not true. It's my relationship to the Lord and only that, nothing more, nothing less. No. Benny, you say that you have made this change not because of your critics, not even because of your nephew or the interviews that he's done or the two books that he's written. You say it's been none of that. Uh, you say it's because of your own relationship with the Lord. Benny, at this point, you do not have a relationship with the Lord. You are a false convert. You are deceiving in being deceived. Benny, repentance is not just owning up to mistakes. It's, just, it's not just saying, I've made a mistake. I've been in error. It does begin there, but that is far from true repentance. Repentance begins with owning your sin. Uh, even though I've, I've watched the video and I've listened to the interview you've done with Steve Strang, I have not heard you own your sin in this. Let's call it for what it is, sin. Uh, I have heard no apologies from you. I've heard no apologies to all the millions of people that you have deceived and that you have um, uh, robbed from money and given false hope to. I've not heard any apology from you. Uh, that, would, that would be saying something, but I haven't even heard that. So repentance is not just saying you're mistaken. It begins with owning your sin, owning it, confessing it publicly. And you've obviously had a very public ministry, and so public sin requires public repentance. You have not repented, Benny. Uh, to repent, you need to begin by confessing a lot of your sin, confessing that you have lied about major events in your own life and ministry repeatedly. You need to confess to uh, lying about all of the times that God that you claim that God has spoken to you when he hasn't, or confessing to at least being severely deceived in thinking he has spoken to you. You need to confess to all of the many, many false prophecies that you have given. You need to, you need to own the fact that as the Bible defines it, you are a false prophet. Uh, you need to confess that and own it. You need to, you need to confess to exploiting the poor and the sick and the desperate and the widows out of their money for personal financial gain. You need to confess to all of this publicly and own it. Uh, Benny, real repentance bears real fruit. Repentance is not just a verbal apology. It bears real fruit. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, John the Baptist said, Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. The Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 26 said, So King Agrippa, I kept declaring that all men everywhere should repent and turn to God performing deeds appropriate to repentance. Real repentance results in real, tangible fruit. Zacchaeus models for us real repentance. You say that you've been spending a lot of time in your Bible, that you read it day and night. Uh, you say you even read the, your Hebrew Bible in the Hebrew. Well, Benny, if you are, then you need to, I would suggest that you go to Luke chapter 19 and look at Zacchaeus. Luke chapter 19, I'm going to read this briefly, just a couple of verses here. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. That's real repentance. He says, if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. Benny, you have defrauded millions of people for 40 years. And I understand that there's no possible way that you could repay each and every one of those millions of people four times what you've defrauded them. You couldn't do that 
if you wanted to, if your life depended on it. I, I get that. But there are things that you can do. And if you are truly sorry over your sin, if you're truly repentant, then that should bear some fruit in your life. And there will, there will be tangible fruit of that. And so even though you can't possibly repay everything that you've defrauded from all of those millions of people, uh, here's what you can do. What you can do and what you should do right now is you should empty your ministry coffers and give every cent that the ministry has to doctrinally sound ministries all your cash, all your everything, all your your the ministry properties, uh, equipment, everything, liquidate it, sell it. I know you can't do this overnight, but but you should you should do that because your ministry has been a fraud for forty years. You should you should empty your coffers, give that money to some good, doctrinally sound ministries that do rightly divide the word of truth then you should join a good doctrinally sound church and you should sit in the pew and you should submit yourself to sound biblical teaching done by biblically qualified elders, men. Submit to that and sit in the pew and learn. Uh, this, is, this would be evidence that real repentance has been wrought in your heart. And Benny, it's not just that you should change your preaching. And uh, people have asked me, well, won't we know if this repentance from Benny Hinn is real if his teaching changes, if, if he changes his preaching? And my response to that, no, actually, actually, if he changes his preaching, that will be evidence that, in fact, genuine repentance has not yet happened. Why do I say that? Benny, because you're not qualified to preach. The Bible has qualifications for men who preach the gospel. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. They're to be above reproach. Elders, preachers are to be above reproach. Benny, you're anything but above reproach. You don't meet that qualification. You're to be apt to teach, Paul says. Able to teach. You've just proven by your own admission that you've been wrong that you're not able to do that you've been teaching serious error and not just the prosperity as i said it's it's the false prophecies it's the doctrinal heresies it's all these things that you've been teaching and continue to teach in regards to healing and and claiming that god's speaking to you when he's not all these things you continue to teach that you're not able to teach you're not able to teach sound doctrine and refute those who contradict Titus 1 verse 9, you do not meet the biblical qualifications for being an elder or a public teacher of the word of God. You just don't meet those qualifications. And so real repentance will be evidence, not if your preaching changes, but if your preaching stops. It stops. If you continue to preach, that will be evidence that you're not repentant. Benny, um, and I say this as, as someone who has deceived myself for years. Uh, in fact, um, your nephew and I were both in ministry before we were truly converted. So if, if you're truly repentant, then you'll stop your preaching and you'll join a good doctrinally sound church. You'll empty your, your ministry coffers because you've, your ministry has been a fraud for 40 years. The Bible speaks of two different kinds of sorrow over sin. And this is something that I think the vast majority of people miss and do not understand. But I believe this is so crucial and this is truly one of the truly one of the dividing lines between a false convert and a genuine child of God. And it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. The Apostle Paul says that there are two different kinds of sorrow here, a worldly sorrow and a godly sorrow. What is a worldly sorrow? A worldly sorrow is nothing more than a guilty conscience. And Benny, I don't doubt that you have a guilty conscience. I don't doubt that at all. Uh, I think that's at least partially motivating what you're doing right now. I don't doubt that your conscience 
is guilty, that your conscience is bothering you. I, I don't doubt that. But that's just a worldly sorrow. In and of itself, that's just a worldly sorrow. A worldly sorrow is a kind of sorrow that says this, what would be, what would be the consequences to me if my sin were exposed? If, if, if everybody knew, what would be the consequences to me? And so we try to cover up our sin, not because, not because uh, we grieve over our sin, but because we don't want the consequences of that sin. And so we try to cover it up. But if we could get away with it, we would go right back to it. That's a worldly sorrow. And Paul says that a worldly sorrow leads to death, eternal death. But there's another kind of sorrow. And that kind of sorrow is a godly sorrow. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7 that a godly sorrow leads to repentance unto salvation. What is a godly sorrow? A godly sorrow is that sorrow that is vertically oriented. A godly sorrow is the kind of sorrow that David had in Psalm chapter 38 and in Psalm chapter 51. Psalm 51, when Nathan came to him, David was guilty of these horrific sins of, of adultery and murder. And his friend Nathan came to him and he pointed his finger at him and said, You are the man. And David was broken. And he, he wept. He grieved over his sin. He, said, he cried out in Psalm 51, Against you and you alone, O Lord, have I sinned. Benny, I pray that Costi is or will be your Nathan. Um, he has exposed you. He has exposed your lies, the deception of your ministry. But I can tell you this, your nephew loves you. And uh, I, I think the world of him. Um, God saved him. And God, uh, Benny, if you, are, if you are truly sorry over your sin, if you are broken and you grieve over it, even though you're a false teacher. And as I said, as, we, as this video began, I don't hate you. I hate your ministry. I hate what you've done. But I don't hate you. If you will come to Christ in true godly sorrow over your sin, broken and grieving over your sin because you understand that your sin grieves God, that your sin grieves him and you do not want to grieve him. You do not want to grieve his person. If you truly grieve over your sin and, and you understand that your, your sin grieves God, I tell people that it is good and it is right to want a savior from hell. Most people do. A lot of people want a savior from hell. And that's good. We should fear God. We should fear the wrath of God. We should want to escape his wrath. But just as much as we should want a savior from hell, we should want a savior from our sin. And the person who wants a savior from hell, but not a savior from sin, has a savior from neither. Do you grieve over your sin? And this is for anyone who is watching. Has there come a point in your life when you have been convicted of your sin, you know that you have broken God's laws, and you grieve over it. Do you, do you believe that Jesus is who he said he was, God in human flesh? Bore the wrath of God on the cross, willingly lay down his life on the cross, bore God's wrath on our behalf, died on the cross, bodily raised from the dead on the third day, proving himself to be who he said he was, God in human flesh. And the only way to be saved is to repent of sin, turn from sin, and place your complete full trust in the risen Lord Jesus Christ and the work that he accomplished on the cross. And if you have truly repented of sin, then there will be evidence of that. There will be fruit in that. Ask yourself, do I love the Lord? And not just warm, fuzzy feelings. Do I obey the Lord? Benny, you've not been obeying Christ for 40 years. Do you obey God? Do you obey the Lord? Do you, do you love his word? Do you love his truth? Uh, do you grieve over your sin? Do you have a love for the brethren? Are you growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? These are all evidences of regeneration, fruit in keeping with repentance. And Benny, as I said, public sin that you've had for 40 years requires public repentance. You're not qualified to preach. If you are truly grieving over your sin, if you truly want to know Christ for the first time, 
ask him to save you. Ask him to grant you repentance. You can't repent on your own. Genuine repentance is in and of itself granted by God. And if you truly come to Christ in brokenness over your sin, godly sorrow, willingness to repent, you come to Christ. On those terms, Jesus says, the one who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And so, Benny, I, I do pray for you, believe it or not. I, I, I do pray for you. I've taught against you and your theology, not just you, not singling you out, but all these others, but because of your what you've said in the, in the last last week or so, I'm, I'm addressing it you but but every other every other false teacher out there uh, I pray that they will watch this video if you'll repent godly sorrow come to Christ he will save you if you'll come to him he will not cast you aside so with that I will I will close the video <laughs>